Hello, and welcome to the History of Comic Books podcast, Episode 1, The Golden Age. The Golden Age of Comic Books is considered to have taken place between 1938 and 1945. While the exact end in 1945 is not quite known, as it mostly ties in with the end of World War II, there is no question when it began, with the debut of Action Comics No. 1 in June of 1938, featuring the debut of Superman. Created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster for a mix of pulp heroes like John Carter and Doc Savage, along with a nice mix of the origin of Moses, he quickly became one of the most popular characters ever invented, and it wasn't long before the comic book readers started asking, where is the comic book with Superman in it? However, his publisher wasn't, was slow on the uptake, with him not even returning to the Action Comics till issue number 7, and then finally taking over the series in issue number 11. Pretty soon he had his own comic in the summer of 1939 with Superman number 1, which mostly reprinted his first appearance in Action Comics from number 1 through 4. With Superman starting the superhero craze, it wasn't long before everyone starting demanding their own, and even more, including his own publisher. As a result, Bob Kane and Bill Finger were tasked with creating one for Detective Comics, and the result was Batman. Like Superman, he was created with a mix of pulp heroes like Zorro and the Shadow, along with an image of Leonardo da Vinci's Man in the Glider. He debuted in Detective Comics number 27 on May of 1939. It was an instant success. As he would also get his own comic in Batman number 1 of spring of 1940, which debuted two of his chief villains, the Joker and Catwoman. Marvel Comics No. 1 debuted in October-November of 1939 under Timely, the company that would be eventually become Marvel itself, and it featured the debut of Namor the Submariner and the original Human Torch, who was at the time an android whose skin caught fire when it came into contact with the air. Wiz Comics No. 2 also debuted at that time and featured the first appearance of Captain Marvel by C.C. Beck and Bill Parker, who today is known as Sajam. Of interesting note, DC would sue his publisher, Fawcett, over copying Superman, Though it was really the other way around, as Captain Marvel was already flying while Superman still was still just leaping tall buildings in a single bound. He would later get his own comic, Captain Marvel's Adventures, number one, in January of 1941. Flash Comics, number one, appeared on November 20th, 1939, featuring the first appearance of the fastest man alive, originally Jay Garrett. The Spirit by Will Eisner debuted as a comic strip in February of 1940 and was notable for its more mature and violent content. In March of 1940, classic pulp heroes like The Shadow and Doc Savage got their own comic book. New York World's comic debuted in 1940 and features the first time Batman, Robin, and Superman appeared on the cover together. The Spectre by Jerry Siegel in More Fun Comics number 52 debuted in 1940, while Our, Our Man appeared in Adventure Comics number 8. Robin first appeared in Detective Comics number 38 in April of 1940 with the intention of being the Watson to Batman's Sherlock Holmes and also to appeal to younger readers. The Alan Scott Green Lantern debuted in All-American Comics number 16 on July of 1940. The Adam debuted in American Comics ni- number 19 on October 1940. Marvel Mystery Comics number 9 appeared on July of 1940, featuring the first team up with the Submariner and the Human Torch. Other big-name publishers started having their characters debut in comics as well, such as Walt Disney Comics and Stories No. 1 in 1940. Superheroes started to appear in other mediums as well, such as the Superman radio show, which debuted in 1940 with Bud Collier as Superman and featured the first appearances of Perry White and Jimmy Olsen, along with the concept of kryptonite. Other genres of comic books started to debut as well, as with War Comics No. 1 and Red Rider Comics No. 1, the first devoted entirely to westerns. All-Star Comics No. 2 appeared in 1940 and featured the debut of the JSA, otherwise known as the Justice Society of America, which included the first lineup of The Flash, Green Lantern, The Spectre, Our Man, Hawkman, Dr. Fate, The Sandman, The Atom, and Johnny Thunder. What's most notable, this team is still being published today, and that lineup is more or less the same. Not a bad run for a team. In March of 1941, Captain America No. 1 debuted by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, with our star-spangled hero famously punching out Hitler on the cover. They would leave after a few issues due to a contract dispute, with a then 17-year-old intern named Stanley Lieber taking over, who would later be known as Stan Lee. All Winners No. 1 appeared in 1941, which was only featured the first team-up of Captain America, the Human Torch, and the Submariner, but also debuted the Young Allies, the sidekicks of Cap and Torch, and Bucky and Toro. 
In 1941, another war comic appeared called Military Comics No. 1, featuring the first appearance of the Blackhawks, DC's famous flying squadron. Police Comics No. 1 debuted in 1941, featuring the first appearance of Pet Plastic Man by Jack Cole, and would get his own series in 1943. The first girl comics appeared with Calling All Girls No. 1 in September of 1941. Classic literature also appeared in comics with Classic Comics No. 1 in October of 1941. In September of 1941, Superman made his cartoon debut with a classic series from Fleischer Studios. The Green Arrow and Aquaman first appeared in More Fun Comics No. 73 on November of 1941. Archie, the classic character and current star of the CW series Riverdale, made his first appearance in Pet Comics No. 22 on December of 1941 by Bob Montana. By 1941, comics were selling $50 million a month thanks to their exciting stories and being a cheap form of entertainment during World War II. Wonder Woman debuted in All-Star No. 8 in December of 1941. While not the first female superhero in comics, that was the Black Fury in April of 1941, she is the one who set the standard for all to follow and became an instant hit. Quality Comics introduced the Spirit and Police Comics No. 11 to comic books on September 42 and Larry Guy's own book to Spirit in 1944, along with the first appearance of his regular black character of a, reg- of, the, of a regular black character in Ebony. Now, I should warn you, if you ever look up this character, he is unfortunately indicative of racist attitudes at the time, but he does tell the distinction of being the first regular black character in comic books. Star Spangled Comics No. 7 introduced the Newsboy Legion and the Guardian by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, another sh- shield-bearing hero by them. By 1943, comics were estimated to sell at $30 million a year with up to $25 million selling per month. Max Gaines left D.C. in 1944 and would found educational comics with the intention to educate readers. It would later become entertaining comics under his son, Bill, best known today as E.C. Comics. Superboy made his first appearance in More Fun Comics No. 101 in 1945. As stated at the beginning of this episode, the end of World War II in 1945 was considered the end of the Golden Age of comic books. During the war, comics were a chief source of entertainment and extremely popular with soldiers, who, as, as today, are very young. Sales started to peter out as the war ended, though, and though still steady. However, the success of this until un- now unregulated medium had drawn some unwanted attention. From parents, doctors, and worst of all, the government. And now it is May 3rd, 2018, and time for a few reviews. First off, of course, favorite comic book of this week, Tab and Blink Were Here, by Kevin Rubio, uh, Lucas Maragon, and uh, Rick Zombo, a collection of the classic one-shots of Tag and Blink, the uh, two idiots who managed to weave their way throughout the entire Star Wars continuity, originally published by Dark Horse, and now under Marvel. If you ever wonder what happened to Chewie's medal, or just how many boffins did die when stealing the second Death Tars plan, this is a classic collection of five issues at $8, but well worth it for any Star Wars fan. Seriously, you will not. You, this is some of the funniest stuff for any any Star Wars or just comics in general. A true classic. Also, I've got a copy on a few of the uh, streaming servers today, especially on the comic book side. I cannot recommend The Tick on Amazon Prime enough. Peter Serovitz is hilarious in the title role, mixing in uh, kind of a sweet-natured but uh, a pompous attitude about him, and uses his stature to great work. And uh, as Ben Engwood points out, um, this is the, the the Tick is designed to uh, make fun of current uh, comic book shows. This is uh, the show, like the Saturday morning cartoon show, and the original sat- uh, sitcom made fun of. It is well worth watching, as I pointed out, serves as brilliant the title role, plus uh, Jackie Earl Haley, probably best known as playing uh, Rorschach in the Watchmen movie, is a hoot as uh, the, the big bad, the terror. Who, just, who steals the show when he's not trying to take over the world, trying to get jazz p- drummer rest lessons. If you're an Amazon surprise subscriber, this is a must-watch. Also, I caught up on uh, Jessica Jones Season 2. Excellent, uh, fun series, like the first um, like the first season, but uh, that's the problem with most Netflix series. That 13-episode uh, fixed uh, limit really hurts the series. Quite frankly, this could have been shorter. Kristen Ritter gives another brilliant performance as it delves into her, how she got her powers. And you know, Rachel Teller is equally excellent, her best friend, uh, Tris, Tris Walker. 
and it does give huge future hints of where those characters are going, but they could have easily pared it down to 10 episodes or less. Nevertheless, if you're a Netflix subscriber, definitely worth picking up and watching. And of course, the elephant in the room, Avengers Infinity War. Whew. Still processing, but it's, this is easily the culmination of the MCU's last 10 years of movies, and it's well worth watching. The, the, the cast is excellent as usual, with Josh Brolin and Thanos stealing the show, easily becoming the MCU's best villain, and quite feeling a quite layered one and complex. You feel for him, even though he does believe in the Malthusian overpopulation myth, which has been long dis- disproven. But the, even when he get the, the extreme lengths he goes through to co- accomplish his mission is just scary. The action by the Rooster Brothers is second to none, as usual, and this is a true epic on every level. If you are a comic movie fan, this is well worth watching. And after seeing the box office gross, I'm surprised you haven't already. And finally, just to remind everyone, May 5th of uh, 2018, of course, the first weekend in May. So you know what that means. Free comic book day. Go to your local comic book store and get some free comic books. And also pick up something, pick up something yourself. I'll be doing my same. Doing the same. And, uh, oh yeah, apparently there's a horse race in Kentucky too, but who cares. Anyway... Thank you for coming back for another episode of HistoryComicBooks.com. Next episode, we'll be going into the interim age after, between the, the Golden Age and the Silver Age. And thank you, and enjoy some comics.